It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, wherever you are, anywhere on my channel. Uh, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. Uh, the guy is still mowing from last week. It's also possible that I'm recording two videos this week to, uh, to catch up. You decide. All right, let's get into the questions. Julio Bliaison. Why are these satellites so bright? Can't figure it out by myself. We got a lot of questions about Starlink this week, no surprise. Apparently it's a big controversy, so uh, I'm gonna, a bunch of the questions this week are gonna be about Starlink and other things. There's the haters, stay tuned. Um, so, the, so right now, the brightest object in the sky, apart from the sun and the moon, is actually the International Space Station. It's brighter than Venus, it's really bright. And it's very easy to see pretty much anywhere on the world. You can watch it fly overhead. Um, if you know when and where to look. And here in Canada, we're so far north that we can have these passes where the space station goes directly overhead. So after Starlink launched, I went out, you know, found one of these tracking places, found when Starlink was going overhead, took out my binoculars and waited, and it went right overhead at the appointed time. And I would describe it, so what I saw was like four bright stars moving that weren't quite as bright. They weren't anywhere near as bright as the International Space Station. They were, um, astronomers would say, you know, they were sort of second to third magnitude stars. Definitely easy to see with your eyes, but not, uh, not super bright. And there was only four. And then when I looked at it with the binoculars, there was another 25 that I could count with my, with my eyes, but they were, say, magnitude five or six. So you couldn't see them with the unaided eye. You needed binoculars. And the explanation that I've heard so far is that the ones that are very bright, are they haven't gone into their full configuration. They haven't gotten their solar panels directly pointed at the, uh, at the, you know, at the sun yet, and we're seeing excessive reflection. So if they are as bright as the four that I saw, that sucks. That's going to be very bright. You're going to see this grid of satellites in the sky at all times. And if they are less bright, the, like as bright as, as the ones that I had to see with my binoculars, you won't be able to see them at all. <laughs> Which isn't really that helpful, right? It's like somewhere in between. They are either obnoxiously bright or too faint to see. That's the spectrum that we have right now. And we're gonna have to wait and see what the final outcome is once they're in their full configuration and, and SpaceX tells us this is, as, this is as little light polluting as they can make them. Deepak Singh. Enough, these corporations need to stop making constellation junk around our earth. We do not need lightning fast internet at the cost of this. I believe that there are other ways to make the internet available to the underserved regions of earth. Earth is not their property to mess with. World leaders need to join together and stop these corporations before it escalates to beyond control. Right now there's three plus billion people who don't have access to the internet. They are the underserved and they don't have access because nobody has bothered to give them internet access. It's not profitable for the corporations. The governments have haven't been willing to spend the money and so they just don't have access to the internet. And, and I think that, that internet access, especially in this sort of modern connected age, is, is like a basic human right. If you have internet access and a way to interact with the rest of the globe, then you have ways to get, get yourself out of poverty, you have ways to communicate, you have ways to share knowledge. That's kind of like saying, um, you know, we shouldn't let corporations, I don't know, it's like libraries, right? Like, would you be willing to, would you say that not pe people shouldn't be allowed to have libraries, right? Um, I think that that we should encourage or f get as much of humanity onto the internet as who wants to be. Um, and at the same time, like like what are the options to be able to get internet online, right? You've got internet service providers. I mean, do you love your internet service provider? I don't. <laughs> My cell phone. Actually, I don't mind them. My my internet service provider is pretty good. My cell phone provider. I would swap them in a heartbeat. And I'm sure many of you, and like, f feel free to, actually don't even bother. Like, I know, I, you don't need to tell me, I know you're not a fan of your internet service provider. So we know what that looks like, right? Um, we need to figure out a way to be able to do this. So what is the solution? You were able to post this comment on this video because you have internet, right? And you wanna deny other people from getting internet? or you want to stop them from being able to do this, uh, I, I would be really interested to see what are the alternative solutions to be able to do that. What is a way that people can get access to the internet 
in a way that that is like uh, fast and reliable and inexpensive and that's the thing that's most important right i don't think we should be held over the barrel by our internet service providers i think we should be able to get internet access as cheap as humanly possible ideally free because that's like it's like learning and it's communication and it's and it's economy it's all of these things um i'm open to your suggestions what is the way that we can do it satellites if it works will be kind of amazing Internet anywhere on the earth, no matter where you live, crossing political borders, uh, the price that we pay will be uh, a loss of our sky. And, and yet, people watching this channel, they are going to be fans of space exploration. They want that bold future where we're living in space. That will be space pollution, right? Let's say that we, ha we build a, a space power system that is floating in space that is that is producing power and, and beaming that power down to Earth so we don't have to give, you know, put out nuclear plants and, and coal plants and other stuff here down on Earth, it's going to be really bright and you're going to be able to see it. And yet we won't have to produce carbon dioxide. So everything's give and take. I think that for sure SpaceX should have spent more time consulting various parties like um, astronomers to get their feedback on whether or not this is what are the ways to minimize the impact on the science at the same time being able to provide this service to the world and if five years from now it's only rich uh, traders on on finance you know if rich finance companies are the only ones able to use this service and and it has not provided low-cost internet to the world then i think we should be outraged so let's just see how this plays out Todd Magda. How do chemical thrusters work in a vacuum? Have you heard of the Newton's law that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction? When you take, say, a rock and you push against that rock really hard, you're giving that rock, you're pushing that rock with a force. And that rock is pushing back against you with a force. And so a rocket in space, all it's doing is throwing things out the back of the rocket, in this case, the hot gases from from explosions and the rocket is receiving a force in return and it works on earth and it works in space just like if you were sitting out in space and you threw rocks you would move same process critter why do people think it's cool that there's a doomsday device at the center of our milky way there's a black hole with 4.1 million times the mass of the sun at the center of the Milky Way on a regular basis, star systems fall into it and they're torn apart and added to the black hole. That sounds pretty cool. Now, you don't have to worry because it is 26,000 light years away. If there was no dust in the center of the galaxy, you couldn't even see it. If it was gobbling up stars on a regular basis, you couldn't even see it. Uh, and if you got as far away as you know a few billion kilometers away from it it would have almost no impact on you it's only when you get very very close to that black hole that the tidal forces get to the point where they'll tear you apart and pull you in so that black hole is definitely not coming to consume everything in the milky way and we're not going to swirl into it like a whirlpool. In fact, if you replaced the sun with a black hole of the exact same mass, all of the planets would just continue orbiting around this black hole sun uh, forever. So it's only when you get close that these things are dangerous. So don't worry about black holes. <laughs> Several times. I think all launch providers should offer discounts for launches of a scientific nature. You can still charge full price for military and commercial satellites. Science is for the betterment of all humans. We already kind of get this with SpaceX. There's an interesting, I've talked to a bunch of folks at NASA and their thought on SpaceX is with the prices so low with the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, say 60 million for a Falcon 9 launch, 90 million for a Falcon Heavy launch. That is say 20% uh, of the launch price of say one of the more traditional things. So what that gives you is a cheaper launch cost. It gives you more missions. Really, every time you use a Falcon Heavy, you can launch one additional science mission. So that is like the most dramatic discount that a science mission could possibly hope for. But 
over time, as the launch prices come down and down and down, this rising tide should lift all the boats. And I think if at a certain point, SpaceX is like making so much money, then they should totally provide an additional discount to any science missions. It's only fair, Elon. Do the right thing. Troy Smith. Do you think the camera monitoring the stars for positioning could be used to create a spherical image of stars and then layer them to track the movements and maybe track rogue stars that have been ejected out because of black holes? All right, I'll give a little context here. You're talking about Starlink, and each of the Starlink satellites has this star tracker that is able to look at the sky, recognize the constellations in the sky, recognize the stars, and then know where it is in comparison to all of the other satellites. And it'll use that for avoiding potential collisions with other things. It'll use that to reposition itself. It's pretty cool technology. I can't imagine how you would be able to use that really as science though. The, there's a very, very sensitive, like one of my favorite telescopes is, is the Gaia mission. And its job is to watch the positions of stars very carefully, watch how they move, and then use that as a way to understand how far away stars are, where they're moving, what the future looks like, and things like that. And I can't, I just can't imagine that they're sensitive enough to do that. And we actually got a bunch of people responding like, you know, could we connect up all of the star links to act like one big telescope, like the Event Horizon Telescope? And the problem is, is that this idea of interferometry, you can, you could theoretically have all of the Starlinks have a telescope and they would act like a telescope that was much larger, but you need to be able to align those telescopes to within individual wavelengths of visible light, which is very, very difficult to do. The Event Horizon Telescope used radio waves, which are very large, and they were able to do that with very precise timing to be able to, to sort of synchronize up all the different observations that they were doing. And then they had to run a supercomputer simulation, or they had to run supercomputer to crunch all this data to produce the final image. So unfortunately, individual small telescopes just can't work like an interferometer in any productive way. That said, there are definitely missions that have been planned that would be an interferometer in space, but was built from the ground up. So if you flew, six telescopes in a perfect formation and they were able to move themselves side to side compared to each other to within an individual wavelength then it would be an amazing telescope that scientists would love to be able to use and and so far there's been no real practical interferometry mission sent to space although there definitely should be and i've ranted about this so many times Vienna the Grill. All I want is this won't lead to corporations controlling and stalking people of information and feeding it to intelligence agencies. That cat is out of the bag. That horse, no. That horse has left the stable? That horse has left the stable. That's the one. Um, uh, w right now, right, all of our internet is routed through lines in the ground, through fiber optic connections, through cables that go under the ocean. They pass through many different routers. Each opportunity, when a router receives the information and forwards it on to the next location, somebody, some company, some government gets to look at that data. Uh, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to do it, but in many cases they have ways around that. Like We are already in a surveillance state for the most part. A lot of what you do is observed by governments and corporations. Like That's already happened. So and yet here you are watching YouTube videos and making comments. So you, you feel okay with it? Um, and I am kind of excited about what a satellite based one could do like Starlink because there actually aren't any intermediaries. You, you, your, your trend, your receiver transmits up to a satellite, the satellite rebroadcasts that data to all the other satellites, your receiver, pulls in the packets that are meant for you and throws everything else away. And there is no intermediary. So no one is really going to be snooping in between. So it feels like this is a much better situation than, than the ground-based, cable-based, fiber optic-based routing situation that we currently have today. But again, we'll have to find out what the actual final implementation is and whether it meets that goal. But I hope it does. Uh, Elon Musk has said that that's the plan, so we'll have to find out if he actually delivers. Cairo Beats. So are you actually in a forest or is it a green screen? This is of course the, uh, the ongoing, <laughs> the ongoing uh, trope meme that goes on with this channel. Am I in a forest? 
Am I on a green screen? I don't own a green screen. I'm in a forest. Now my hands smell like cedar. Um, so yeah, that's, and I, I've never owned a green screen. I don't know how to use one. It's just, I live on Vancouver Island. It's light, it's nice here. It's much better to light things outside. So we just take the whole camera outside and find a spot and shoot. Right now I'm in my backyard, uh, which is why everyone's using their lawnmowers. Uh, but generally over the summer, we try to go to more interesting backgrounds, take all our gear, go for a hike in the forest, set up, shoot an episode or two, and then go home. So that's how we do it. Or maybe it's a green screen. Vazalem. Will they be able to provide uncensorable internet to China without their government being able to regulate the service nor stop people from accessing it unless they go into their houses and take their receivers? Or can countries like it prohibit satellites over it the same way they rule the airspace? There's no real way that they can stop these satellites, right? The satellites are gonna be going overhead nonstop at all times. So people in North Korea will be able to see dozens of Starlink satellites in the sky, people in China, people in Africa, people in uh, parts of Canada, wherever, right? You're all gonna see the same amount of satellites when the final constellation has been, has been built. There's no way to stop the satellites from going overhead. And th these rules have been defined a long time ago about how you're allowed to use outer space. And so SpaceX f meets the criteria of the Outer Space Treaty. How they'll be able to stop it is one, they could demand that SpaceX shut off the transmitter receivers whenever they pass over China. So if you've got a satellite that moves into Chinese airspace, they could put pressure on China. They could say, oh, we're gonna shut down the Gigafactory if you don't turn off the transmitter receivers for Starlink and that would censor it. I don't know how well that would work. I don't know if SpaceX would concede to that, but that's what they could theoretically do. And if you had a smaller country, say something that was thinner like North Korea, then it would be really hard to be absolutely certain that the asteroids are, or the, <clears throat> absolutely certain that the satellites are, are not transmitting in your airspace. The other way is, of course, they could restrict the purchase of the receivers. So you could not be licensed to operate Starlink in China, and then China could say, you're not allowed to buy, you know, you're not allowed to sell the receivers in a country, and if you're caught with a receiver, then there's serious penalty, and it, there will be a black market of these receivers in these other countries. It's kind of inevitable, right? So... And it all just depends on how hard the country is willing to crack down. But in terms of, like, there's no way to route data in the way that the existing internet works. It's all broadcast all the time. And your receiver will, will only receive the information that's meant for you. And, and that's going to be really hard to stop. So I'd be interested to see how this plays out. My guess is, yeah, China will say you're forbidden to have the satellite transmitters on when they're over Chinese airspace. And so a Starlink satellite will go overhead, and as soon as it detects it's in Chinese airspace, it'll shut down, stop transmitting, wait until it's the other side, and then start up again and not provide service in China. But we'll see how it plays out. Everything. Oh, you're so worried about space junk, but not the oil spill and garbage that is coating the ocean. Chololol. Why can't I be worried about space junk and garbage in the ocean and oil spills? And global warming too. I feel there's enough in my heart to be freaked out about it all. Liam Winter. If you've got money to invest, now would be the time. Actually, it turns out you can't invest in SpaceX if you wanted to. It is a private company. It's not a public company like Tesla. You can't give them your money. Now, maybe in the future, they may open up a, some kind of fundraising. And if you're a bank or something, maybe you can get in on a, on a fundraising round. But for the largest part, there's no way for you to invest in SpaceX, which is the part that's amazing is why. <clears throat> this is because Elon Musk wants to colonize Mars. And the only way that he thinks that he can do that is if he runs a private company, because any public company is going to have shareholders, it's going to have directors, and they're going to mess with the vision of colonizing Mars. And so only a... <laughs> Only a private company is going to be the one to be able to do that. And that's why SpaceX is going to remain private, which again, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a mind bending concept when you think about it. So as I mentioned in the video, the global telecommunications industry is $1 trillion plus a year. I think it's like, I've saw over from 1.2 to $1.6 trillion. If you take a severe, you know, a significant fraction of that, that is plenty of flights to Mars for a private company that, that, has, that is not impacted at all by the public markets. 
<laughs> Timothy Clancy. Don't trust anything Musk says. He is the king of overpromise, underdeliver. I will absolutely agree with you that that any timeline, any deadline that Elon Musk says, you can almost guarantee isn't going to happen on time. The Falcon Heavy took a lot longer to to get working. The Tesla cars took longer. The Model Three, these things take longer. And yet, go ahead and watch the Falcon Heavy launch and landing, and you will see one of the most astonishing feats in engineering, aerospace engineering that humanity has ever done. Right? Their rockets land together on these pads, and they land on a barge out in the ocean and that like if you aren't inspired by seeing that happen then uh, you're dead inside so the any deadline that musk states you can just add double and add 10 right just increase the number and yet he does and his companies do seem to achieve a huge portion of their objectives they just take longer so I, I don't discount any of the, of the deadlines that they say, or I don't discount any of the goals that they say, and I just don't assume the deadlines are going to happen. And I wonder, I mean, to set a deadline, to set a goal like that, is to rally your employees, to rally your team, to accomplish this objective together as a group. And I would love to know from the people who work at SpaceX, the people who work at Tesla, what is it like to have your leader say, here's... To, to announce an arbitrary deadline that is probably not achievable, is that inspiring because it just gives you a goal to go after and then when it slips you go after that new goal and eventually you cross the finish line or is it disheartening? So if you're part of SpaceX or Tesla and you have a feeling about this, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. All right, that's it. Those are all the questions this week. As always, uh, I really enjoy them and uh, so thank you so much for putting in the questions, give me the chance to answer them. As always, if a question pops in your brain, anywhere on my channel, write it down, I'll gather them up, answer them here. All right, we'll see you next week.